a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This today is the fourth reading that I'm going to do from the book of Martin Luther that he wrote in 1545. His legacy, you can call it, against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil. For everybody who was not aware of it, the Antichrist is the office of the papacy in, on the top of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. There is the Antichrist. There he has been predicted. There he has always been. And there he will be until our Lord Jesus Christ comes back and will consume him with the breath of his mouth. As it is written in Second Corinthians. This today is the fourth reading and I hope to can, uh, that I can get through a few pages until the top of page 290 because then we go into the start of part one of this book. And what part one the other part and part three are all about, you will learn at the end of this little broadcast. So let's see that we can get this done within an hour, as is my habit to go for about an hour in a video like this. Today, by the way, is the 25th of October 2017, so I'm still in the quote-unquote Reformation month to see to get these recordings done. Even though you're going to see that a little bit later, I'm sorry. I was really busy uploading the same reading in German. And my German brethren were really looking forward to receiving the book reading during the month of October. So you will probably then get this a little bit later. But nevertheless, nevertheless, we are going to read against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil. If you're going to read along with me, I am on page 284 on the top of the page where this reading is going to start right now. But there is a great uproar about what Emperor Charles did at Spires. Antichrist Pope Paul III is worried about his son, Emperor Charles V, lest some great misfortune befall him. What then has his dear son Charles done at Spires? Well, he did not want to start a bloodbath in Germany, in which the devil, the Pope and the Cardinals would have loved to bathe, and which would have protected their hellish scum. Instead, the Emperor suspended the Edict of Worms from which all the unrest in Germany had come, and he did this so that they could resist the Turks in a united front, as a pious Christian Emperor should provide his fatherland with peace and protection. So Martin Luther refers here to that instead of persecuting Martin Luther after the Edict of Worms, where he stood in 1521 and defended his works in front of the Emperor, instead of persecuting Martin Luther and hunting him down like it should be done in the eyes of the Pope, because the Pope excommunicated him with the papal bull beforehand, the Emperor found it more important to battle the Turks, Islam, that stood at the doors of Vienna to defend the Empire against this enemy, but which, by the way, <laughs> like the French, what we've spoken about in the, past, in the parts before, the Pope uses different persons to stir up wars. He used France to stir up war against the Emperor, and he used, of course, the Turks or Islam to stir up war against the Emperor, so that he is busy doing everything but not ordering a council, a free 
and German Council, as Martin Luther always asked for and never, of course, got. We just have to remind ourselves of this fact. But he says here correctly that the emperor's job actually is to provide his fatherland with peace and protection. This is what the scoundrel in Rome calls wrongdoing. Of course, because he does not exactly what the Pope wants, he does more what he thinks even his people want him to do. Oh, dreadful sin! So what do the rascals call well done, apart from what they do in Rome? From now on the sun is weary of shining on them, and the land, as they themselves say, can bear no longer, as we can read in Genesis 13, verse 6. For thus I have heard it said in Rome myself, quote, It is impossible that it should continue like this. It must break. Then the other emperor, Charles, did Sorry, then the other thing Emperor Charles did at Spires. Oh, dare I mention it? Horesco reference. I shudder at the thought of it. Dear one, pray a paternoster, means a Lord's Prayer, for me, so that I may not, like Eli in Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 2, verses 2 through 17 and 22, be punished. O oh, dear son, S-U-N, do not get frightened and do not turn black at my speech, now that I tell of such a great sin. This is the sin. Emperor Charles would like to have peace and unity in religion, just as, if he, as he would like to see peace in the empire. But because he has now for twenty-four years vainly, wor vainly worked to attain a general Christian council from the Pope, and has attained nothing except that the Pope has drummed on his snout and treated him as a fool, he has set about following the worthy example of Constantine, Theodosius I, Theodosius II, Martian, Charles the Great, Louis I, and many other emperors, calling a national council, although he really has the right and authority to call a general one, no matter what the Roman rascal spits out in his decretals. Oh, may God forgive me if it can be forgiven that I have dared to speak of such an appalling sin. Oh, the Emperor Charles not go out in the sunshine, for the sun might fall from heaven before such a great sinner, and we should have to pay for him, and sit in darkness forevermore. Oh, that the Holy Fathers, Pope, and Cardinals with their horde would support us with their good works and their virtues, like the Epicurean faith, sodomy, simony, mockery, blasphemy of God and his Christians, and all their worship. Christians should be put between quotation marks, of course. Perhaps their God, whom St. Paul calls the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, will have mercy on us. Now, what does 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 say about maybe that, uh, as Martin Luther says, perhaps their God, um, whom St. Paul, meaning Antichrist, Paul the third calls the God of this world will have mercy on us. So we turn to Second Corinthians four worth verse four, and there it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And we all know from a later verse, of course, that the God of this world is Satan, because it's their God, it's the God of the Roman Catholic Church. That is not the Creator God that we worship. Do you almost believe that the Roman See, Pope and Cardinals are possessed of all the devils and their rascally gibberish has neither bottom, neither bottom end nor measure? 
do you almost believe that such villains must be Epicureans and the enemies of God and man? Here you certainly see that the Pope would rather see all Germany drowned in its own blood than have peace there, and would rather have all the world go to hellfire with him than that one soul should be brought to true faith. That is so true what Martin Luther says here. And what Martin Luther says here 500 years ago is exactly the same way today. The Pope, Satan, and the Pope is the vicar of Satan on earth, would rather to put the whole world into a big bloodbath before they see even one soul being brought to the true faith. The true faith is the faith of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, is the faith of the Creator God of the Bible, the 1611 uncorrupted King James Bible, the uncorrupted Word of God. Yeah? Satan does not like any soul being brought to the true faith. They would rather bathe the whole world in blood, and we are going to expect this to happen in the near future. It is not so far away. I am not a prophet, but I know the Bible, and I know what the Pope is up to, because the Pope is up to fulfilling Daniel's 70th week all over again to his conditions, at his terms. That's what's it all about. And then, of course, a lot of people will say, Ah, Jörg, you see, here is the tribulation that everybody always spoke of, and you say it's not biblical. No, there will be tribulation, but it's not biblical, because the 70th week of Daniel is already fulfilled. But even Jesus Christ warned us that we will have tribulation in this world. And that tribulation is going to come. And that's going to be a bloodbath. That's going to be an inquisition as we have never seen before. Wait for it. Because... The devil and his representative here on earth don't want one soul be brought to the true faith. Now that the Pope's horrible frightening will has n now that the Pope's horrible frightening will has not been carried out but hindered by Emperor Charles, the Pope cannot forgive it but threatens him with the example of Eli. Now here you have a gloss of the Si Papa Discorsi in um, number 40, quote, If a Pope is found to have forgotten his own and his brother's salvation, to be lazy and lax in his works, and to be silent about teaching the best, which is that much more harmful to himself and others, as if such could happen in faith, and moreover drags with himself to the devil in hell countless souls, in, uh, in great throngs, who, with him, must eternally suffer great pain. Such sin cannot be punished by any man alive, for he is the judge of all, and to be judged by none, unless he be found erring in faith after the year of Plato. <laughs> Now, this is very interesting, because we are saying here that he is not to be punished by any man alive, for he is the judge of all. This, of course, is a, refer a reference of Martin Luther to the papal bull Unam Sanctum of Pope Boniface VIII from uh, 1302, which you know already that, there is, uh, that it is absolutely necessary for every human creature to be a subject of the Roman pontiff for salvation. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary. After the year of Plato. So what does uh, Martin Luther address here with? So we go into a little footnote. And that's, uh, that reads, Post Anem Platonus. Uh, so that is after the year of Plato in Latin. Meaning, another interpolation, meaning a long time or never. The notation of a year of Plato, or a great year, also called Annus Magnum, is based upon Plato's phyto, uh, phytogerian speculations concerning the movement of heavenly bodies. Pythagorean speculations. They are all speculations. They are all theories 
they have no hard facts, they have no hard evidence, even Plato's Pythagorean speculations were speculations and no facts. Okay? Concerning the movement of heavenly bodies. Anyway, Martin Luther says here that he is the Pope is judged by none unless he be found erring in faith after the year of Plato, which will never be. <laughs> and that's why the Pope a little later was <laughs> declared infallible in the First Vatican Council. Instead, Martin Luther continues, the whole Christendom pays all the more zealously for his office, especially when it notices that its salvation depends next to God on his welfare. Do we get that? Christendom prays all the more zealously for the Pope's office, especially when it notices that its salvation yeah, of Christendom depends next to God on his welfare. Now where does the Bible say that the welfare of the Pope is part of salvation? I think we read this absolutely nowhere in the Bible. But this is of course what the Pope teaches. He is God on earth. Therefore he is, quote unquote, Lord of Lords and kings of king, King of Kings. That's what the Pope claims to be. Therefore the earth is his footstool and, ev footstool and everything is his. And that's why Martin Luther says here, especially when it notices the Christendom or Catholicism, when it notices that its salvation depends next to God on his welfare. No, salvation of the Christian depends only on God because it's God's grace that gives salvation. Nothing and nobody else and surely no man and especially not a Pope. Now everyone can see that such a decree must have been blown into the Pope and the Roman See by all the existing devils with one breath. And I, when I read this, dec when I read this decree 26 years ago, thought by God that these were vain words, like the donation of Constantine. Now here is another mention of things that you maybe have not heard of very often. If you want to learn more about the donation of Constantine, I can advise you, of course, to my book reading of um, Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow. There I speak about the donation of Constantine. I can advise you to go to the archives of First Amendment Radio and uh, listen to Tom Fress reading the book The Woman Rides the Beast from Dave Hunt because he goes into the donation of Constantine. And when you search my YouTube channel, and, and especially I think the second, but I also think on the, on the Jaguar 66, uh, the donation of Constantine, I made a video on that, on the reading that Tom Fress did uh, on a certain day of, out of that book from Dave Hunt about the donation of Constantine. Now, what is the donation of Constantine? I'm just going a little bit into a little footnote here to explain to you what we are talking about so that you get an idea and that you have an idea what you can do in your spare time for history research for yourself because you don't have to believe the historic things that I read to you here you can research them for yourself so this book gives in the footnote the following explanation about the donation of Constantine this is a papal document of the 8th century that claimed Constantine the Great had ordered the, uh, all ecclesiastics to be subject to the Bishop of Rome. Sylvester, and uh, uh, to the Bishop of Rome, Sylvester, that was the Bishop of Rome at that time, and transferred to him, quote, the city of Rome and all the provinces, districts and cities of Italy or of the western regions, unquote. <laughs> Shall I read this again, that you understand this well? The emperor Constantine gave the bishop of Rome, Sylvester, and transferred to him the city of Rome, all the provinces, districts, and cities of Italy, or of the western regions, meaning 
all of the at that time known world. The Renaissance scholars Nicholas of Cues and Lorenzo Valla proved that a forgery, this paper from the 8th century, they proved it a forgery in 1440. Luther published the donation with marginal notes already in 1537. And therefore you can see into um, the high articles of the most holy papal faith called the donation of Constantine. This is also to be found in Luther's works. Then follows the German title, but I'm not going to read that to you because that's not of importance. But the point is that you understand that the Pope bases his temporal authority on the donation of Constantine from the 8th century, a paper which is found in, the 14, uh, in 1440 by Lorenzo Valla and Nicholas of Cues, a forgery. That is the basis, the, let's say, earthly basis that the Pope quotes for his temporal power. Now, when we read this book, we will go into three different points. You will see that later on at the end of this reading today. And the three points that Luther addresses in this book are, among others, I'm just going to have a little look at it, that I can read it to you right now, then you will understand it. He says, first, so the first point that Martin Luther wants to prove with this book, whether it is true that the, Pope of Rome, uh, that the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom, above councils, above emperors, above angels, as he boasts. Yeah? And the point is that, therefore, of course, the Pope stands on the so-called donation of Constantine. But that is a known forgery. And they know that in the Roman Catholic Church even today, so when you open up the Catholic Encyclopedia and you look up the donation of Constantine, you know that they know that it is a forgery, but still they insist on it may be a forgery, but the fact remains that it was so. <laughs> so they are in absolutely denial. And that is their temporal basis for the temporal power of the Pope. Now there's also a temporal basis for the spiritual power of the Pope, and that's the one that we spoke about already earlier. That is the fact that the Emperor Phocas in 606 gave the spiritual power to the Bishop of Rome, made him Pope by exalting him above all other bishops of the Eastern and of the Western churches. And therefore the very first Pope was Boniface III, as we read in earlier readings of this book. So, the Pope's claims of the quote-unquote two keys of power, of the spiritual and of the temporal power, have earthly, are earthly based. Okay? They go back to Emperor Phocas, who gives the Bishop of Rome at that time the power to make him Pope, point one, for the spiritual power above all churches. And second of all, with the forgery paper of the donation of Constantine, the claim to the temporal power of the Pope is a forgery. And it comes from man. It does not come from God. That's the point that we have to understand. While the Pope always claims that he is the successor of Peter, who never was in Rome, that's another thing we're we we going to speak about another time, when I'm going to read the book from Ernest L. Martin about Simon Magus against Simon, uh, Simon uh, Peter versus Simon Magus. That's another point. But the Pope claims to be the successor of Peter, the Apostle Peter, yeah, and because Peter were given the keys, which we will see in the future readings in this book that it is not true, to um, bind on earth and lose on earth, and whatever he binds on earth will be bind, bound in heaven, and whatever he loses on earth will be lost, lose, lost, lost in heaven. Lost, <laughs> lost in heaven. Um, th that is a fraud. That is a fraudulent explanation. That is a fraudulent reason for the power of the Pope. These two keys were not given to Peter. And I'm not going into that because the whole book deals about that. And I don't want to 
tell you something in my own words right now that we can later on read with Luther's words and my explanation on it. I don't want to go ahead on what's coming in this book, but the point is that we understand, please, with the mentioning of the donation of Constantine here, the donation of Constantine is a forgery. The Emperor Constantine never gave the quote-unquote Pope, in this case Sylvester, the power, as stood here in the footnote, above the city of Rome, all the provinces, districts and cities of Italy, or of the western regions, that never happened, that's a forgery, and the so-called spiritual power that Focus gave to the Bishop of Rome, how can an emperor give spiritual power to another man? That's a joke. So when you really see what happened here in history, when you see what really happened and on what the Pope actually builds his quote-unquote power, his quote-unquote authority, then you see it all comes from man, not from God. But he calls himself the replacement of God on earth. Now wake up! If I'm going to give you the power to rule over all the world, do you have it? Or are you just thinking oh, he's going to make a joke? Well, it's the same. I can say to you, you have all the spiritual power of the world, or you have all the temporal power of the world, and you will have actually the same power that the Pope has. The point is, the people always bend their knee to the Pope because they believe him. People are so gullible. They were gullible tune, uh, uh, tune. <laughs> that's bad Flemish. They were gullible at that time, and they are gullible still today. The donation of Constantine is a fraud, and the making of the bishop of Rome, the bishops of all bishop, the bishop of all bishops by Focus also is a fraud. Focus doesn't have the power to do that. God could ordain them. God ordained Moses and Aaron to be high priests, right? They were ordained by God. They were real high priests. The Pope is just a deceiver. He is the Antichrist. He does not know Christ. He does not speak in the name of Christ. He is not even a Christian. He is a pagan. He is one of the devil. He is the bearer of the mark of Cain. And everybody who follows him also has the mark of Cain. And then you're going to have to ask yourself, do you want to be the bearer of the mark of Cain, or do you want to be the bearer of the mark of the living God? I made my choice. What's yours? I'm going to repeat this last sentence, that we can get into this again. Um... Oh, I have to go a page back even. <laughs> Everyone can see that such a decree must have been blown into the Pope and Roman See by all the existing devils with one breath. And I, when I read this decree 26 years ago, thought by God that these were vain words, like the donation of Constantine was, and that it was impossible for any Pope to be so corrupt that he would accept such a decree or build upon it. <laughs> Martin Luther is so surprised that it was actually impossible for any pope to be so corrupt that he would accept such a decree or build upon it. Every pope ever since built on this corrupt decree. But since Sylvester, and here Luther talks about Sylvester Prerieras, and you know him, better than my German brethren, because at that time I didn't even know Priarius. We talked about him in the, first four, uh, in the first five videos that I read to you about Luther's view of the Antichrist. And there we met Sylvester Priarius, against whom Luther wrote several tracts. For example, you can see a response to the dialogue of Sylvester Priarius concerning the power of the Pope. Um, that is earlier work that Luther uh, published, and we remember that when we were reading this little 20-page paper on Luther's view of the Antichrist, before I started reading this book, that was the 
inaugural work, yeah, the, the, the work that preceded this one, there we read about Sylvester Prieria. So you guys know him already. The Germans, uh, I missed that because I didn't read that paper and Prieria is not mentioned this way in the German book. Anyway, Anyway, but since Sylvester Prierias and some others wrote against me and used things like this against me, I really had to believe it. And as you can see in Antichrist Pope Paul III's brief, he is also of, its, of this opinion and would like to lead the whole world to hell with him. Now, now, whoever does not want to believe that the papacy is the devil's possession and of his own realm is welcome to ride to hell with him. Whoever does not want to believe that the papacy is the devil's possession and of his own realm is welcome to ride to hell with them. If you don't believe that he is Satan, well then join him and join him on the broad way, the yellow brick road. We hear the word of our Lord, as in Matthew 7.15. Beware of false prophets. 1 Corinthians 1. The spiritual man judges all things. More of this later. We shall and shall be the Pope's judge. And no one shall stop us. Because we cannot be stopped. We Bear the Bible as our sword, as our weapon. And when we put up the Bible high in the air, Satan runs. Runs. Because he has no weapon against the Bible. Oh, he has all kinds of weapons against all carnal things in this world. I agree. But spiritually... Satan has no weapon against the word of God. When he tempted Jesus Christ 40 days in the desert, the only thing Jesus had to say was, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written. And Satan had no argument, no point. We shall and should be the Pope's judge, and no one shall stop us. Even Satan cannot stop us when we hold up the Bible and say, It is written. Thus saith the Lord. Those powerful words Satan can do nothing against. The truth is the truth. And the truth does not compromise. And when you don't compromise the truth, hold up your Bible and walk a new walk. And show the Pope that you can judge him by his deeds with the Bible, with the Word of God. Luther continues, but let us also see how the ass distorts the scriptures as he introduces Eli and his sons. The text in 1 Kings, or 1 Samuel 2, 12 through 17 and 22, as mentioned before, says the sons of Eli were evil, were evil scoundrels and committed three offenses. First, they neither knew nor esteemed the Lord. Second, they did not know what the priestly duties to the people were. And third, they lay with the spiritual woman who served God in the tabernacle. These were widows who, after the death of their husbands, dedicated themselves to service in the temple, as it says in Luke 3, uh, in, in, in Luke 2, verse uh, 37, about Holy Anna, that she never again left the temple, fasted and prayed, etc. The first item, neither to know nor to esteem the Lord, means not to believe in God, scorning his promises or word, and living in unbelief roughly and ruthlessly, without any fear of God. 
The second, that they did not esteem their priestly office, that is, how they should sacrifice and teach the people means, as it says in the text, that they did what uh, that they did what they wished with the sacrifice and whatever they spoke against the law had to be right, which upset the people very much. The third is that they shamelessly committed adultery with dedicated women, for they had wives of their own, and did this in a holy place, in the temple before the face of God, who had promised that he would dwell there. Eli made himself a participant in these sins by not punishing his sons. He does speak about it for the sake of the people, but not seriously, for he did not remove them from office, does not want to shame them, and lets them carry on in their ways. That is what God says, that Eli had esteemed his sons more than God. For he preferred the honor of his sons, wishing them to remain in office, to God's word and obedience. This is a fine example and would fit extremely well if the Emperor Charles would turn it around and hold it under the Pope's nose. He would then be hanged with his own rope, namely like this. Do you hear, Pope Paul? First of all, you have no faith, and you and your sons, the cardinals and the curious riffraff, do not honor God, for you are Epicurean sows. Just like all the popes, your predecessors, when one reads the papal decretals from the beginning to the end, one cannot find a single letter, not a single letter which teaches what faith is or how one should believe like a Christian, nor can any iota of faith enter the heart of a pope or cardinal, that much is certain. Second, you with all your Roman court and predecessors do not know what a priestly office is, how to instruct the people in God's words and commandments, or how to praise God, for one can find nothing of this in any decretal, so that one could make a sermon. Instead, all of it is human teaching, let me add, Gnosticism, learning against learning, man-made traditions. All of it is human teaching, philosophy and conceit, which is simply idolatry. Third, you and your children commit abominable unchastity for the cardinals and the sodomists and hermaphrodites of your court lead such horrible lives that heaven and earth quake and tremble before them. You see, hear, and know, and know this well, and yet you say nothing about it, punish and reform nothing, but laugh at it and find pleasure in it, as we can read in Romans 1. 32. Yes, that is another important uh, chapter that I will just open up here in my King James Bible. Romans chapter 1 verse 32. Because Martin Luther quotes this here. This is one of the closing, um, uh, this is the closing verse. Who knowing the judgment of God, which the Pope does, that which that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This is what Martin Luther talks about here. You see, hear, and know this well, and yet you say nothing about it. You punish and reform nothing, but laugh at it, and find pleasure in it, exactly as it is foretold in Romans 1, verse 32, by Paul. That is why you shall not have it as good as Eli, but will have to join your predecessors in the depths of hell. Indeed, in this way the example would correctly apply to the Pope, and thus it would be found that the Pope and his cardinals are crude asses, unlearned, in the scripture. Now along comes this bishop of Hermaphrodites and Pope of Sodomites. 
that is, the apostle of the devil, and quotes this example against Emperor Charles. And just as he and his predecessors are malicious in their gibberish, so does he also try to make God a scoundrel in Holy Scripture. He pretends that the emperor is a great sinner for having suspended the Edict of Worms, for the sake of peace and for wishing to convoke a national council. He makes sin and damnation praiseworthy, high, noble, princely virtues. Another one of the idolatrous horrors of the Pope is that he makes sin and damnation where God wants none, as one can see throughout the whole decretal. The reason is that he is, as the lawyers say, an earthly God. So he must make sin and damnation what the heavenly God considers virtue and innocence, as St. Paul says in Second Thessalonians 2 verse 3, man of sin, son of perdition. In Hebrew, man of sin means one who not only is a sinner in his own right, but who through false doctrine causes other to sin with him. As Jeroboam, the king of Israel, sinned in 1 Kings 14 verse 16, or, as scripture says, made Israel to sin through his idolatry. Thus, this Pope of Sodomites, this founder and master of all sins here, wants to push sin and damnation off unto Emperor Charles, although he knows quite well that his rascally tongue lies abominably. And such accursed villains want to convince the world that they are head of the church, the mother of all churches, the masters of the faith. Isn't this laughable? This Pope of Sodomites, founder and master of all sins, here wants to push sin and damnation off unto Emperor Charles, although he knows quite well that his rascally tongue lies abominably, and such accursed villains want to convince the world that they are the head of the church, the mother of all churches and masters of the faith. Why, even if we were stones and wooden blocks, we could see by their works throughout all the world that they are lost. They are desperate children of the devil and also mad, crude asses in Scripture. Someone probably would like to curse them, so that they might be struck down by lightning and thunder, burned by hellish fire, have the plague, syphilis, epilepsy, the plague of St. Anthony, leprosy, carbuncles, and all the plagues. But these are all caresses, and God has a long ago punished them with greater plagues, just like God's despisers and blasphemers should be punished as we can read in Romans 1, verses 26 and 27, namely, that in sanity they have become so obviously mad and raving that they do not know whether they are or want to be male or female. They are not ashamed in the presence of women, and their mothers, sisters and grandmothers are among those forced to see and hear such things of them to their great distress. Shame on you, popes, cardinals and whatever you are in the cure, at the curia, that you are not afraid of the cobblestones upon which you ride, which would like to swallow you. Now I have to go a little bit back to one of the sentences I read here before because you read about the different plagues that um, Martin Luther summed up here and um, uh, it says here someone probably would like to curse them so that they might be struck down by lightning and thunder burned by hellish fire have the plague syphilis, epilepsy the plague of St. Anthony leprosy, carbuncles and all the plagues but these are all caresses now when I read the German book there were a few expressions of illnesses, of plagues, like this one Martin Luther says here, that were just not explained in the book. So I even went to the English book, because in this translation, the plagues that I've just told you are better explained. 
So it says here in different little footnotes, uh, in, in German it says uh, the, the first sickness is Franzosen, the disease of the French. I did not know what that was, but that is according to the uh, translators here, syphilis. That is the sickness of the, the disease of the French. Then we have epilepsy. Now, listen, this is very interesting. Epilepsy is also called St. Welten, i.e. epilepsy. comes from St. Valentine. Now, the next time when you are a Christian and you take out your wife on this, what is it, 14th of February every day for St. Valentine's dinner, then think about that St. Valentine was revered as the mitigator of this disease, epilepsy, that is linked to St. Valentine. Think of that next time when you sit on a St. Valentine's Day with your loved one together and enjoy yourself. The plague of St. Anthony, St. Antony, frequently called the fire of St. Anthony. That is a disease treated in the Middle Ages, especially by the Hospitalis of St. Anthony, a religious order founded in the 11th century, meaning during the Crusades, because they brought a lot of diseases back then to Europe. <coughs> Although the exact nature of the disease is unknown, it was a serious inflammation of the hands and feet. Yeah, you know, the videos of this reading I prepared already, I always use the same picture, so I will not put the picture in here. But you can do that for yourself, and uh, in my German videos I put the pictures in there of that. Uh, it, it's not very nice to see of the serious information on the hands and the feet, when you see that all the pulses and, and, and all the stuff they have on there, that's, that's not nice. Not nice to see, but... Someone would probably like to curse them, so that they might be struck down by lightning and thunder, burned by hellish fire, have the plague, syphilis, epilepsy, the plague of St. Anthony, leprosy, carbuncles, and all the plagues, but these are all curses, and God has long ago punished them with greater plagues, just like God's despisers and blasphemers should be punished, according to Romans chapter 1 verses 26 and 27, namely, that in, the senate, that in sanity they have become so obviously mad and raving that they do not know whether they are or want to be male or female. That's why they are sodomites. They don't know if they are male or female because God has given them a reprobate mind. Because they are idolaters. They are not ashamed in the presence of women, and their mothers and sisters and grandmothers are among the flows forced to see and hear such things of them to their great distress. Shame on you, popes, cardinals, and whatever you are in the curia, that you are not afraid of the cobblestones upon which you ride, which would like to swallow you. The imperial laws have much to say about how to handle furious insane, mad people. How much greater the need is here to put in stocks, chains and prisons, the popes, the cardinals and the whole Roman sea, who have not become raving mad in the usual way, but who rage so horribly that at one time they want to be men, at another they want to be women, and never know at any one time when their mood will strike them. We Christians should nevertheless believe that such raving and lunatic Roman hermaphrodites have the Holy Spirit and are the heads, masters and teachers of Christendom. We Christians should nevertheless believe that, well, the Catholics, we true Christians, we know that they are not. But Martin Luther writes here, we Christians should nevertheless believe, because they make us believe, that such raving and lunatic Roman hermaphrodites have the Holy Spirit and are the heads, masters and teachers of Christendom. That's what the Pope makes believe the whole world today in 2017. That's the problem Martin Luther addresses here. 
Nevertheless, of all the things they do, of all the things they teach, which are absolutely unbiblical, we, quote-unquote, Christians should nevertheless believe that such raving and lunatic Roman hermaphrodites have the Holy Spirit and are the heads, masters and teachers of Christendom? No, I say no, wake up, get out of her, my people. No way. By their fruits you will know them. Open your eyes, open your ears. Listen to what the Pope says and compare it to Scripture. And not one true word comes out of his mouth. Open your eyes and see the deeds. By the fruits you will know them. Is that Scripture? What the Pope does, what the Curia does, what the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church does? No! And that's why Martin Luther addresses that here. But I must stop here, Martin Luther says, or save what I could write further against the papal briefs and bulls, for my head is weak, and I feel that I might not get everything said. And yet I still have not gotten to the points I had intended to make in this book. I will do this first, before my strength gives out completely. I wanted to cover three things. First, whether it is true that the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom, that the Pope of Rome is above councils, above emperors, even above angels, etc., as he boasts. Second, whether it is true that no one may sentence, judge or depose him, as he bellows. And third, whether it is true that he has transferred the Roman Empire from the Greeks to us Germans, about which he boasts immeasurably and, be and beats his breast. Should I then have some strength left, I shall again take up this bulls and briefs and try to see if I can comb out the crass, crude donkey's long, unkempt ears for him. And this ends the introduction into the reading of the book Against the Roman Papacy, the introduction by Martin Luther before he turns to part one. As he just said, three points he wants to address if God gives him the strength to do that. So, he says, three, uh, uh, three points is that he wants to address. First, whether it is true that the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom above councils, emperors and angels as he boasts. He boasts with his speeches, he boasts with his decretals, he boasts with his bulls, he boasts from the Roman Catholic hierarchy with all the power that he, the Pope, is above councils, above emperors, above angels. Okay. Now, Martin Luther addresses this point in German in the next 50 pages. This starts here on page 290, and I guess this is going quite a long, a long way, and will take us a few readings to get through this very first point, and then we have after that the other part and the last part. So Martin Luther addresses here three points. Yeah, this goes until uh, the bottom of page 358, so that's about 60 pages from 290 on. Okay, And that, those will be the next readings of this book, Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil. Now Martin Luther announces here already, should I then have some strength left, I shall again take up his bulls and briefs and try to see if I can comb out the crass, crude, donkey's long, unkempt ears for him. Well, the point is that Martin Luther did not have the power anymore, because Martin Luther died within a year after publishing this, his last work, against the Roman papacy an institution of the devil. And now we are almost 500 years after his nailing of the 95 Thesis to the church door at Wittenberg, when he started this reformation. And then, third, 28 years later, in 1545, he wrote this book to tell us all that the pope, that the papacy is 
the Antichrist of the Bible. The biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist is no one else but the office of the papacy on the top of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, which is the synagogue of Satan. If you have not understood this by now, I think there is no need that you are going to watch any more videos of me. If you got that now and you want to know more about the details and how Martin Luther explicitly takes the Bible in this part one and refutes every claim of the Pope that he is actually above councils, emperors and angels as he claims and you want to you learn about the refutation that Martin Luther wrote almost 500 years ago, then stay tuned. And you're welcome to join me in the next reading of Martin Luther's book Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution of the Devil. For now, that's it for today. Jörg from Joggler66, signing off, says God bless you, and bye bye. <laughs>